Hello friends, we have started discussing water governance this week and in earlier session we talk about the basics of what is governance, what is water governance, uh, why we need water governance. We will continue the discussions uh, over the need of water governance and then what are the various elements, dimensions and principles of water governance. So, water governance capacity is basically a country's level of competence to implement effective water management through policies, laws, institutions, organizations, agencies and uh, regulatory and compliance mechanism. One need to understand that without a clear policy, it is very difficult to establish coherent laws. If we do not have a policy to follow one how we can make uh, how we can basically convert or uh, confluence into a good laws. Then without clear laws it is very difficult for organizations to know how to operate. If there are no set guiding laws or guiding principle for operation of agency or organization how they will make the decisions, how they will take the steps. So, uh, it becomes very difficult until unless we have a set clear laws. So, in the absence of laws, we will not have effective organizations or effective agencies and when we do not have effective organizations, it is very difficult to implement and enforce the uh, the reforms or the field level decisions that needs to be in uh, put through in proper place. If we uh, let us take an example first ok. So, for example, in Delhi the state of Delhi 20 kiloliters of water is being supplied for free. Now, this has came through a clear policy, clear government's policy. Whether it is good policy or bad policy, we are not debating on that, but there was a policy and that eventually was converted to a law. Without policy, one cannot without having this thing in mind, ok, uh, we need to provide basic quantity or basic slab of water free to all consumers without this policy, how one can make a law. Now, if there are no laws made onto this, if let us say somebody says ok, we will give free, but there is uh, nothing in return, no law, nothing such has been made. So, uh, then the Delhi Jal Board or the uh, Municipal Corporation of Delhi, how they will operate? because if there is no clear law, how they will uh, charge for the uh, water, whether to charge or not to charge, if to be charged at what rate to be charged. So, all these things there has to be a clear law for organizations and agencies to operate. So, this clarity in law is needed, then, then only the organizations will have a guiding principle on how to act under given set of circumstances. And if DJB or uh, sort of uh, municipal corporation of Delhi knows how to deal under such and such circumstances, how to charge, whom to charge, whom not to charge, what level of water is to be given free, thereafter how to price water. So, if all these set guiding principles are there, they can implement it into the field, but if it is not there, if there is no written law, nothing. So, then the efficiency of the gel board operators or efficiency of the municipal corporation personals will also be decreased, they will not have any accountability on themselves. So, the like efficiency of the organization or agency as a whole goes down and if we do not have an effective organization, how we are going to implement and in, uh, enforce the decision or the policies into the field, it is going to be very relaxed. Okay. So, that is why we need good governance practice on all stages. 
Now, if we see what are the various elements of water governance, there are formal elements and there are informal elements. The formal elements are the one which formally exist and abiding. There are written legislations okay, or laws, okay, uh, constitutional binding laws. Then there are property and water use rights. Okay. So, uh, if I own a property, I am the owner of water resources beneath it or all the resources beneath my property. So, all these sort of specific formal laws and legislations are there. So, this right to water or right to property that I own, these are the formal elements. Then consensus building is another formal element in the uh, water governance. Further, consensus at a formal level. Okay. So, uh, if two people agree, two people uh, say that okay, uh, we will adopt this policy, we will go by this and they formally agree to certain consensus. So, that is uh, with that, that is a formal element of the governance. While there are formalized agreement and contracts where the consensus may not be there, but still because it is formalized contract or formalized agreement, it is law abiding and uh, that will be sort of uh, considered as a legal entity okay? and that is why that is also a formal element. There are informal elements where are uh, non-formalized agreements, okay? uh, let us say two people verbally saying okay, uh, let us uh, let us withhold these conditions or let us share the water like this or let us take this decision into this particular dispute or this such and such case. There are certain customaries law okay, which are again uh, not as per legislation, but generally believed. Okay. Uh, for example, if there is a pond, who owns that particular pond or uh, there is uh, a municipality is allowed to use that pond for withdrawing water and supplying water for domestic purpose even without formal authority on that plant, uh, that pond or that lake. So, those kind of uh, some customaries law or customaries trains are there which are informal elements of governance uh, practices and there are uh, tacit understandings. Okay, which are again uh, not law abiding, okay. the general kind of understanding okay, uh, the two people or two parties or two agencies have regarding the governance or management of any resources in this case let us say water. Then if we see the different dimensions of water governance, we have uh, our United Nations Development Program suggest that there are uh, four distinguished different dimensions of water governance. There is a social dimension, there is an economic dimension, there is a political dimensions and environmental dimension. Okay. Now, the each dimension has its own importance. Okay. For example, the social dimension will will see how the water is being distributed or is being used or is being managed on a social scale, whether the distributions are equitable or not, whether the deprived population are getting water or not, whether it is allo being allocated to just let us say. Uh, the uh, well to do or richer class of people only or it is being distributed judiciously to all the sections. So, that dimension is very important. Unfortunately, uh, we do not give too much emphasis to social dimensions while water distribution. Uh, in many cases, 
even in Delhi let us say you have some posh localities where water distribution or water demand and consumption is as high as 400, 500 liters per capita per day while in some other section it is as low as 30 to 40, 50 uh, liters per capita per day. So, this is certainly not a equitable distribution. Equitable distribution does not mean that each and everybody should get equal water. So, equitable distribution does not ensure that everybody gets the equal quantity of water. The demands could be different because of the living standard as well. Now, somebody having a large house or lawn or uh, large family will have different water requirements based on their living standards. Somebody will have a very small family, small size area, so their requirements would be different. But still, a fair all these points need to be considered, but still a fair distribution policy is to be devised. So, that the it is not that those who cannot afford too much or those who cannot pay too much does not get water. Okay. So, those kind of uh, social dimensions needs to be taken care while devising a water governance mechanism. Then there are economic dimensions which primarily relies on the efficient uses. Okay. So, one need to when we go for a let us say policy decision or policy making or making a governance law or uh, practice or principle, we need to understand this that the water in different use has different values. Okay. We discussed this earlier. But uh, just to recall that water in a domestic use has different value, value does not necessarily mean the value or the price it is fetching, value incorporates everything. So, uh, there is a social component also to the value. So, what is the net value of the water for a particular use for a let us say industrial use for a uh, agricultural use for uh, municipal uses, domestic uses, uh, horticulture uses. So, what is the different values and which one is the most efficient use and uh, whether there is a possibility of prioritizing that use without hampering social or environmental causes is need to be seen and evaluated while setting up governance principle. So, the economic dimensions is again a very important dimension of the water governance. Without economic sustainability, without economic efficacy, it is very difficult for any, uh, any policy to withhold for large period of time without additional burden. Okay. Then there are uh, political dimensions. Okay. Now, the political dimensions is in uh, like in a democratic manner how people are able whether people are able to participate in the uh, governance mechanism or not, uh, how much freedom the different stakeholders in getting, how much role and responsibility the different stakeholders are getting in the uh, governance devising governance policies all this will come under the poly, uh, under the political dimensions. So, by and large the user community, the citizens whether they have any say into the policy making or not that will be uh, sort of based on the political dimensions. Okay. And then there are environmental dimensions one need to see, one need to look for the different environmental regulations, environmental protection man measures, how the resource hampering could be avoided, what are the uh, minimum environmental flow of our streams or minimum groundwater uh, availability is to be ensured, how much abstraction can be permitted from uh, groundwater, how much withdrawal can be permitted from uh, running stream, river or lake or those kind of uh, water bodies. So, the sustaining ecology, sustaining the aquatic ecology 
also needs to be considered while making or guiding the policy decisions under water governance and that uh, the uh, environmental dimension makes one of the very uh, one of the very important dimensions of the water governance so the social dimension will basically uh, work on the equitable uses of water resources economic dimension the economically efficient use of water resources and the role of the water in the overall economic growth is to be uh, considered uh, in political dimensions the dem democratic opportunity to the various citizens various stakeholders to influence and monitor the outcomes into the water governance and management uh, policies and sustainable use of water resources and ecosystem integrity uh, needs to be ensured under the economic dimensions for water governance now if we see the principles of water governance there are there are multiple objectives multiple principles through which the good water governance is ensured uh, the dublin water principles bring water resources under the state's function primarily okay that uh, the overall responsibility is the government is the state and then uh, for maintaining the system maintaining the water resources and priority rights again maintaining does not means managing day to day operations maintaining means having a uh, ownership of the water resources in general okay and uh, having a role of let us say regulatory agencies or regulatory bodies where uh, the principles of participatory management asserts and uh, all that uh, meaningful uh, deliberations are taken care under the umbrella of the government okay. although the operation can be sublet to the uh, public or private entities. Right. So, uh, then the there has to be sort of again uh, the action agenda of Dublin water principle also suggested that whether we should go uh, for a meaningful decentralized uh, system at the lowest appropriate level. So, uh, because there are lot of issues related to management in large centralized system which could be avoided at least to some scale in the decentralized system, but having a decentralized system of very small scale again will need for multiple systems and there are going to be huge cost involved and may be not sustainable as well. So, what would be the lowest appropriate level for decentralization all this uh, needs to be uh, considered. Now, if you see the various uh, principles of governance, so there is three major principles the effectiveness, the efficiency and the trust and engagement. Okay. Now, uh, this is under the efficiencies uh, you see that there has to be the data and information available. Okay. There has to be a financing mechanism, okay, a governance structure for financing the water uh, systems, water utilities. There has to be a regulatory framework. Okay. So, uh, there has to be a policy regulatory framework for ensuring the efficiency of the water governance. We are not talking about efficiency of water services here, we are talking about the overall water governance. So, the efficiency of the entire policy making system needs to be ascertained and there has to be innovativeness in the governance means uh, adopting for any good uh, suggestion any good uh, practices which could improve the water services. So, uh, or in an innovative fashion like for example, you have treatment. So, it is not uh, the you, you are stick to a conventional treatment technology. Now, there are advanced treatment systems available, but you are uh, stick though that no I am fine with the conventional water systems that is not a 
efficient way to manage resources or to manage water services. So, instead if you see that there are innovative solution or innovative government po governance policies are available, one should actually opt for those in order to uh, in order to take the system towards more better efficiency. There has to be trust and engagements. Okay. So, uh, there is to be monitoring and evaluation that is one of the very important aspect. The resources or the water services need to be monitored and evaluated. One should have a clear cut idea of how we are doing in terms of let us say uh, securing sustainability of resources that can be assessed only through monitoring. If you do not monitor the water quality regular, regularly, how would you know that uh, whether the quality of my resources are good or not. If you not monitor the let us say water supply regularly, how would you know that uh, whether I am controlling the demand or meeting the demand in appropriate fashion or not. If you do not monitor the revenue recovery systems, how would you know that okay, uh, whether I am getting the uh, expected, uh, whether I am generating the expected revenue or not. So, monitoring is essential at each and every step. So, uh, all the different aspects of water services or water ma resources management needs to be monitored properly and that data needs to be analyzed and the uh, outcomes are to be evaluated. Then there is uh, trade off across different users, rural and urban areas and generations. So, uh, while discussing the sustainability aspect, we did discuss that there are conflicts in the different uh, sectors, different type of uh, approaches and that conflict needs to be managed by a fair trade off. Okay. So, that trade off can only be done with proper trust and engagement. So, if we are doing let us say if you are putting up polluter pay principle which is a trade off between the social concerns and uh, uh, financial concerns. So, we are charging industries for polluting river right. This cannot be this should not be done without taking industries in the trust okay, or without engaging industries. We should make industries aware in a good governance principle the industries should be made aware that okay, since you are releasing pollutant to the river which are uh, deteriorating the quality, which are deteriorating the environment or ecology this needs to be treated since you are not able to provide treatment we will charge you this much and we will take care of the treatment systems, we will take care of the pollution in a larger uh, aspect. So, that polluter pay principle or for in for that matter any such trade off needs to be done with proper engagement of both the parties if they involved and there has to be a trust made. So, uh, the trade off could be across different sector of users, across rural and urban areas, across different generations. Then stakeholder engagement, we, dis we have talked a lot about this that all the stakeholder need to be participates, then integrity and transparency will eventually lead to the build up of trust. If we know that okay, the system that we are uh, getting water from or the uh, system which is providing water services is transparent. One can see every scale what is happening, how these decisions are being made, how much is the revenue being generated, how much subsidies are being given and it is done in a fair and uh, with adequate fair and integrity. So, that means that uh, those trust will automatically build up. That is another set of principle of uh, the good water governance and then there is a effectiveness of the system where we see what is the capacity, what is the policy coherence, how, uh, how much coherent policies one is able to make, what is the appropriate scale within the basin systems and then what are the role and responsibilities okay, of the uh, 
different stages involved in the overall water governance including from the policy making to the implementation stage because water governance has all these different levels uh, involved and incorporated with it. So, that is how this uh, different aspect of water governance, uh, different principle of water governance need to be seen. So, there is a participation whereas, uh, as per United Nation Development Program, they have some 8 to 9 uh, guiding principle of water governance. So, uh, there is participation means all citizen both men and women should have their voice representing uh, their interests in policy and decision making. Okay. The participation depends and hinges on the government how inclusive approach it is following. If government is receptive to uh, the suggestions to the uh, involvement of the uh, various stakeholders, there will be there will be more cases of participation. But if government is reluctant to have this kind of participation in the system, uh, people will eventually because if nobody listens to them, why they will go again and again to voice their concerns or opinion. So, they will also slowly and slowly uh, sort of move away from their involvements. Uh, transparency where information should flow freely within the society. Okay. Uh, these processes and decisions should be transparent uh, and open for public scrutiny. Uh, there is equity, so equity in all groups of society both men and women. Okay. Uh, there is accountability, so government, the private sector and civil society organization whosoever is involved and have some role in the governance has to be held accountable as well for the decisions. There has to be a coherence in the decision. So, uh, the because of the sort of increasing complexity of water issues, policies and action must be coherent, consistent and easily understandable, easily deployable in the field. That is another uh, guiding principle of the uh, good water governance. There has to be responsiveness. So, organization and institutes that are managing that are dealing with the water services should be responsive to all the stakeholder should serve the stakeholder and respond properly to the uh, sort of preferences or changes in the demand or any new any uh, fresh circumstances appearing. There has to be integration. So, uh, water governance should uh, enhance and promote integrated and holistic approach in a larger uh, section. So, that the different aspects, different, uh, different stakeholders, different aspects, different opinions are integrated and the governance uh, principles or the policies are designed keeping view in all uh, keeping view in uh, all the different inputs then there has to be ethics okay. because uh, we are dealing with water services here and water cannot be considered as a profit making good or profit making entity. Okay. So, or uh, there is another like social concerns and all that are also involved. So, there has to be a proper ethics in the water governance the ethical principles of the society uh, where it functions needs to be uh, considered needs to be accounted uh, for uh, for devising uh, water policies or water governance principles. So, like the traditional water rights need to be respected, the uh, allocation is to be done to the poor and deprived people as well. Uh, it should not be basically at very high prices uh, in uh, which makes them uh, unaffordable. There has to be ethics let us say uh, I am a company operating a, uh, some factory. I should have that ethics that I should not pollute water, I should not release my waste water untreated directly to the uh, river bodies. 
So, those kind of uh, some professional or corporational ethics is needed in the uh, water management as well and uh, when the principles are being laid for a good water governance, these points must be considered and must be uh, taken into the proper measure. So, um, we will end this session here and in next uh, session we will talk about further about the various other aspects of the uh, various other aspects and practices, good practices of water governance. Thank you.